welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I am doing so well today, Tim. How are you? I'm doing all right. I'm doing great because we talked to a friend, Andrew Gold. This is his second appearance on the show. He is a podcaster, a documentarian, and now an author. Yes, uh, Andrew Gold has the podcast On the Edge with Andrew Gold, and we had him on to discuss his documentary about Padre Manuel Acuna, who was the exorcist in Buenos Aires, which is titled Exorcism, the Battle for Young Minds. You can find that on andrewgoldpodcast.com slash documentaries. This episode, this conversation that we have with him runs the gamut. If I do say so. It does. It does. It starts pretty light. Um, we kind of joke around with Andrew a little bit. He's a peer. He's a colleague. He's a lot of fun to talk to. Um, but he dives very deep into these subjects. And some of them are disturbing, including uh, the one he's written a book about, about pedophilia. Well, Tim, we don't call it pedophilia anymore. We call it minor attracted. Ugh. Yeah, And we get into that quite a bit during this interview and his experience with people who are minor attracted. And we also talk about his other documentary, which is premiering at the Terra de Tutti Film Festival in Bologna, Italy. So congratulations to him. This one is called My Body, Their Choice, and it is about the ultra, ultra pro-life woman known as the crazy baby lady who he forms a relationship with, and you can see that gradually deteriorate as he continues to discuss her beliefs and her whole principle system. Andrew dives very deep into these topics and he loves getting uncomfortable and we love having these conversations with him. So make sure to check out On the Edge with Andrew Gold. Check out his films if you uh, if you can. There are links in the show notes. Check out his website. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. And feel free to check out all of the things that we have going on by swinging over to crawlspace-media.com. Enjoy. Welcome back to the podcast, Andrew Gold of On The Edge with Andrew Gold. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. How are you guys doing? Thanks for having me on, by the way. Oh, absolutely. We're so glad to have you back on. I, I feel like after we had ended our conversation the last time, it was just inevitable that we were going to uh, connect again and have a, another conversation about equally... Um, I don't want to say disturbing, fascinating, equally <laughs> darkly fascinating topics, which um, we have a couple we're going to bring to the table. But how are you doing? You're all over the place. You're a globe trotter. You're a filmmaker. Mm. You're a podcaster. Where are you? How do you find time to do this? Are you? <laughs> how, do you? Do you fuse? Well, I guess it's the same as the same with you guys. It must be. Uh, it's just you just do it, don't you? And you have this weird, strange podcaster life where it's not really fair on your family and friends because you they never know when you're going to work. You they never know when you're going to have to talk to somebody in the states. So this is quite a normal, okay time. It's four p.m. But I'm on something again tonight at like eleven over here because they're in the states. And there's that constant battle between you know how much time do you want to spend on your own work and podcasts and how much are you going to spend trying to publicize it and promote it by going on other podcasts. It's a great job though, isn't it? Getting to talk to like different people all the time. Don't you guys find? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We love it. I, I I think about the the things that uh, other jobs that I've had in my life and. They've been rewarding, but not to the degree that this is rewarding, where you can reach out to anybody like reaching out to you or you're reaching out to us. And you can just you can just pick the fascinating person that you want to speak with. And, and you just have a conversation about these topics that I feel are important to other people to, to learn about, which you know we'll get into today. Um, but you did mention something interesting where it kind of takes a toll on your family because you don't have that typical nine to five. Uh, how do you... Because you're not just a podcaster. You, you do a bunch of other projects as well. How do you explain that? And I don't want to say justify because mm. I think that's a bit too strong of a word because I think people just will understand if you explain it. But how do you explain that to um, your loved ones? 
It's a, it's a really difficult one. And I think an, another part of it is that this kind of job doesn't feel like a job to other people. So my girlfriend's a lawyer. So she's sitting there re trudging through like 400 pages of some really difficult law stuff. And then other friends of mine are going into the office. And, you know, my dad is getting a, a, a train up into the middle of London, you know, packed on a on an underground train and all these things. And I'm sort of sitting here chatting and it is fun. Um, but also... And, and that's great. And that's the risk we took, I guess, when we all sort of put all of this work into it. We sort of went, okay, we're not going to focus so much on the other sides of things. We're going to try, and it's, it's entrepreneurial. We're making our own thing here. Um, but that is difficult because often I will be on Twitter or something just trying to do a whatever, I'm, you know, share something. And that is just, it's not easy when you don't have a huge following. You're just pushing and pushing. Um, and it can look to your partner and other people in your life like you're just on Twitter mate you know you're just on Instagram what are you doing that's not and I'm like no but it's work and you never really turn off and I mean how I deal with that and you're right I do other things but not so much since uh, lockdown and everything Um, I was making documentaries it was just so hard to get them away and get them uh, taken to tv channels and bought it's just I've got one next month this one about abortion and the crazy baby lady that's going to a film festival um, but I actually filmed that a year and a half, two years ago now. Um, so I'm not doing too much of that other stuff, but then it's just a case of, yeah, it's just your life's a mess until you are making like the big bucks, which is my hope. And, and you know, it's it's not that many people get there in podcasting, but there are a lot of people who do. Um, and you just got to hope for that in five, 10 years and you have a difficult life. But so, you know, look at doctors, look at uh, financial consultants or whatever, you know, they're working crazy hours as, as well. So... I guess, it, yeah, it must be the same for you guys. Yeah, sometimes I find it difficult to uh, separate work and home life because my work is here at home, the home office, you know, and I think a lot of people can relate to that too. And it's kind of hard to just turn it off. You know, you go downstairs, hang out with the family and you're still working. And it's like, I'd really love to have more of a separation there. Yeah, one day. I, I, I think that, I mean, do you guys have a whole team of people? Yeah, we have a legion oh, yeah. of people. Yeah, we have yeah. hundreds, actually. Hundreds, thousands, maybe. We call it an <laughs> army. It's an army. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. No. I'm, I'm imagining no. <laughs> Is that a no? Because <laughs> even just one or two people, though, that's... I mean, some people... Yeah. I don't have anyone. You've, you've got... Yeah. There's a Jennifer who appears in emails. Yes, yes, she uh, she is great, Jenna Mel, um, and uh, yeah, and, and we definitely work with some other folks as well, um, helping out in one area or another. Jenna is definitely our our main cohort. Yes, because mm. I wonder how much is Joe Rogan doing? You know, so he's the biggest <laughs> podcast in the world, I guess, right? Yeah. And his podcasts aren't even edited, from what I can tell. You know, it feels like you. I think you guys edit yours, don't you? Quite, you know, yes. pop, succinctly. I do as well because we're control freaks. A lot of people I'm finding just don't and they're still getting just as many people listening. So I wonder if that's a, a place where we could all relinquish a bit of control and just let it be. Joe Rogan doesn't seem to. When there are times where he makes a mistake or they talk over each other, it's just left in as it is. Uh, right. And three hours, bloody hell. So I wonder, if, does he just <laughs> turn up, uh, has a list of you know interesting topic points because people tell him, his team tell him and then he goes home. So that's the the end goal, maybe. Yeah. I, I think that show and a lot of shows are maybe sports shows and things like that, a little more chatty. It's almost more like traditional radio, um, mm -hmm. whereas I think what we do is uh, just a little bit different um, still where, you know, you want to cut some stuff out. Um, yeah. Traditional radio stuff, you know, you just you just correct it if you make a if you flub. Uh, yeah. You correct it as you go. Yeah, we like to polish. If, if we ever get to that level, I am going to make wildly inappropriate and irresponsible comments directing people on how to treat their health during a pandemic that's what i'm gonna do i'm, I'm gonna, gonna i'm gonna that. use my influence to give absolutely atrocious advice you know what that jokes aside that would be a nice feeling to feel i'm big enough that and, and obviously we all want to say we're good people and we wouldn't do that but a nice feeling just to think i'm big enough that i could say whatever the hell i want the totally you know uninformed and who cares? I would like that. <laughs> yeah, I think once you reach that level, you just if if you read an article, then someone will tell you, "Hey, you got a bunch of listeners. You're an expert. You read that article, yeah. right? Then you must be an expert on it." 
Oh, Don't man. listen to the doctors. He does say I'm not an expert, and then says a lot of sort of yeah facts as if he as if he were. It's, it's dangerous, I think, isn't it? Oh god. Yeah. Well, what an interesting thought experiment to have now. Like that is is that called a defense mechanism? What is that? Not a defense mechanism. What is that called? He he just yeah, prefaces yeah. something by saying, "Listen, I'm not an expert, but now I'm going to give you my very uh, <laughs> passionate opinion about something, knowing I have a significant influence." He's so he so just passionate. prefaces it yeah. with. Like the 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 yeah. the get out the this could be wrong, but because <laughs> <laughs> then you, no one can ever come back and say like, hey, what are you doing? It's like, listen, I told everybody I was I wasn't an expert. Yeah, yeah, I, I, it works. It works. I I do that sometimes. I think. Oh, I'd love to be able to do that. Imagine that the power. <laughs> the <laughs> oh no, he's he's I don't know. You know, he speaks for what three hours every, and it's three times a week. Is it or something? I don't. I don't listen to it. I, I don't a, know either. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I'm not sure. I, I think if you speak that long about anything, you're inevitably going to say some dumb stuff. Um, yeah. And yeah. He's obviously a bright guy, but yeah, definitely mm-hmm. done. Uh, said some things that are just head scratching. Well, here, yeah. listen. Okay, so the guy is a black belt in multiple uh, MMA. Um, he's he's a black belt in jujitsu. So if he's talking about jujitsu, I'm going to know he knows what he's talking about. Yeah, you know. Yeah, but he doesn't have a, a medical degree, so <laughs> I'm just saying, yeah. stay your lane. Just stay your lane. Yeah. Like, well, you know, what you could say though, and I, I'm sure you. How, how many episodes of this have you guys done? Fifty thousand. A million. It's like a million, isn't it? You're good. Look yep. at you, you. You both like mute the microphone like so quickly and unmute it. I'm just watching that for, <laughs> for anyone quick. listening. They're really good at that. I don't do it because I just think like maybe you can't hear me, but maybe you can hear sort of me swallowing and stuff now. I'm panicking because you guys do it, um, <laughs> but, but I think it would distract me. But it's th- okay. So you've done a million episodes, right? How much you must feel a lot smarter than when you started. I feel dumber. <laughs> I feel. I feel. I actually. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've softened. Oh man. Okay. Well, maybe that's it. Well, you're supposed to feel dumber as you get older. That's true. You're supposed to feel that so- Socratic thing of of the. I I now realize how little I know. But at the same right. time, you must have picked up like so many. You know, I've been doing yeah. mine a year, and it's what have I done? I don't even know. Seventy episodes. Seventy episodes or so. And these people are geniuses that that we're able to get on. Some of them, you know, on both of our podcasts and. It's, it's a little bit like, and I'm sure you feel this way as well. I read a lot of their books as well. And the whole time I'm like, I almost want to wake up my girlfriend and say like, oh my God, this fascinating thing. As soon as I finish the book, yeah. I remember about 1% of the whole book. But if you read 100 books, that's like you've read 100% of something. So you, you do learn bits and pieces. And he's done now like 15 years, three times a week, spoken to the biggest intellects in the world. So whether he is smarter or not, I don't know. But he must feel a lot like he is smarter. It makes sense. That's a- Great point. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I think just sort of rubbing elbows with people in the crime world, uh, doctors, you know, people like that, that we've spoken to, we, we know, we've hung out with, that kind of makes you feel like you can keep up with them, at least intellectually, when, you know, at least in a conversation, you know, not actually uh, taking a test or anything. It's a nice, and you got you got like a it's a party trick as well. You go to parties and things, and somebody will mention uh, something about some crime that, you, and you'll be like, "Yeah, I know about that," and you can fill in the information. <laughs> uh, I, I'm reading a book right now about eugenics, right, from a progressive standpoint, because I've got somebody coming on who's a left wing uh, scientist who wants to talk about how we can use eugenics in a in a positive way. And the problem with taboo subjects like eugenics and pedophilia, which I, I think we'll talk about at some point, because I've been looking into that. Um, is that when every when something is so taboo and we don't want to talk about it, the only people who know everything about it are the bad people. So with eugenics, it's like if you want to find somebody who's like knows everything about eugenics, it'll be like a white supremacist. Um, and it's really important that the rest of us stop going, oh, but that's taboo. I don't want to talk about it. We need to know about it as well so we can debate those people and tell them why they're wrong. And obviously it's the same with pedophilia. If you want to, uh, you know, the people who know every last detail about every statistic to do with criminal uh, sexual offenders and that kind of thing it will be the pedophile community so we need to know that stuff as well well i guess that's a pretty good segue into one of the topics (laughs) that we discussed uh, prior to this interview um you had brought it up prior to the first time we spoke Mm. this is a topic that you've been following for quite a while and you approach it in a little bit of a different way uh can you how do we even how do we even introduce this subject without having people feel dirty 
and mm. like they want to not listen to it. But you had a point when you're talking about eugenics, it's the same thing. It's like, hey, you can't just turn it off and it's not there. But I get not wanting to know about it. It's an emotional reaction. And it's something that I've had to get uh, become more understanding and empathetic about other people's reactions to it. I've been looking into, they would call themselves minor attracted persons. We would call them, in Britain, pedophiles. In the States, you say pedophiles. Um, when I started, it was it was absolutely shocking to me. And I, and I had some moments that I'll get into that were really, you know, heart and mouth and it was very, very difficult. I was, I was sort of walking around in a daze almost for weeks, uh, just recounting in my mind or replaying in my mind some of the, the, the weird encounters I had. Now I've been looking into them. I've written a book about uh, these people I've been meeting, um, and I've got a literary agent, and he's just found it impossible to even get editors to, to, to look at it, which would imply it's a book stating some sort of... Uh, controversial philosophy which it just absolutely isn't I, you know it's it's really nothing that most people wouldn't think i don't think um but what i've had to realize and and, and become accustomed to is that after a couple of a couple of years i've become a little bit desensitized as anyone does as you guys must find with some of the true crime stuff i mean you could probably walk into a party and go oh yeah this guy he shot this guy's head off and other people are like whoa and they they're not used to that and they they react uh badly sometimes and I understand that I, I don't like the word trigger warning. It's, not, it's something about the word triggers me, I suppose. Um, but I, I have started to come to terms with the fact that I should say to people before I start talking that the subject itself is daunting and it is difficult uh, for people to deal with. I don't generally talk about abuse and hor horrific images and things like that. Just for anyone listening now, that's not what I know about. That's not what I've investigated, really. What I have done is I've gone and while well, I was living in Berlin, uh, I was looking at what would be my next controversial topic. Uh, I always like these taboo places, partly because they fascinate me, partly because some of the bigger, better known writers are, are going to leave those spaces alone for the rest of us. I mean, John Ronson is a very famous writer who did the psychopath test, and he's fantastic. And anything I then come up with, he might then go and do it, you know, so he was unlikely to do something about paedophilia, because why would he? Um, so yeah, I was living in Germany, and it so happened that in Germany, uh, they have the world's only clinic that never reports its paedophiles to authorities, no matter what. Um, they couldn't even if they wanted to, because they don't take their full details. They just get them as, uh, you know, Joe blogs, or they call themselves different names. Um, so that was fascinating to me. And the first thought is like, hang on, so these are therapists who are looking after patients who are paedophiles. Some of them have committed horrible crimes and the therapists are letting them walk back onto the street potentially to commit further crimes. So that was my first thought, my first, my gut reaction to it. I went and spoke to the clinicians and they explained that, look, firstly, the kind of person who's going to come in and say, I did horrible things and I don't want to, and I'm going to do more, ha ha ha, they're not going to come in and get help. The ones who are coming to them are the ones who want help. Um, and they explained that this is the way, whether you care about these people or not, and a lot of people have no empathy for paedophiles, and that's understandable, but this is the way that we need to actually prevent child abuse is by dealing you know if you want to stop murderers you you know you deal with the murderers if you want to stop child abuse yes we look at the of course the children the victims and what we can do to help them but that's after the fact we need to get in there first and deal with the uh the criminals so so that's that's a way hopefully that is explained to your listeners that, that they go okay i i can get on board of actually talking about this what was the name of the facility it's called, uh, well, they, they seem to have two different names. So one is Don't Offend, and one is Project Dunkelfeld, which means Project Dark Field. Uh, it's, it's called, it's not Don't Offend, but it's the German equivalent, which is Kein Täter Werden. And how did you even discover this? So it was just the way I usually work for documentaries. I got to Berlin. We moved there because my girlfriend is from Argentina. We had been living there for six or seven years. That's where I did that uh, abortion film. It's where I did the exorcism film. And I wanted to move back to Europe. She was able to get some sort of German passport for a year at that point while working on getting a British uh, settled, what is it, pre-settled status. So we were moving to Germany. I thought, okay, what can I do? 
Um, and as when I moved to Medellin in Colombia, the first thing was like Escobar, you know, that kind of thing. In Berlin, it was like, okay, so there are neo-Nazis. There's a huge communist faction going on as well. There's all these interesting things. And you just scour the internet. And then there were adverts on the metro in Berlin for this thing, like, you know, all these really strange adverts of, of like creeping shadows and, uh, you know, saying, are oh, you don't be a victim and all this kind of thing. So I had a look and I thought, oh, well, that's it. That's my next project, because this is just so fascinating and just untouched. So that's how I uh, got hold of that. OK, and you're writing a book about this topic? Yeah, I pretty much wow. finished it. Basically, so the, so the book is, for, you know, the working title is uh, we need to, we need to talk about Max. I didn't want to have the word pedophile in the title. Uh, it's just too much. But yeah. uh, it, it the book documents basic. Once I got talking to the clinic, they started putting me in touch with some of their patients, um, and that. That was complicated because they don't even know anything about them. So, you know, so they couldn't just give me their details. What they did was when they spoke to the patients, they said, hey, we've got a journalist from England who would like to talk to you. Anyway, after like a month, I got an email from a guy called Max. It's not his real name. And he said, hi, I heard you're working on this. I'd be happy to meet you. Uh, can you meet me today? And I was like, oh, today? I've, you know, I was about to go out with my girlfriend. I was going to go... Uh, out to a lake. It was a lovely summer day, boiling. It was like, you know, a million degrees. It was really, I just remember it being such a hot day. And I said, are you sure today? And he said, yes, it has to be today. It's the only day I'm in Berlin. You've, you've got to come meet me uh, now, basically. So I had to drop all my plans because I just thought this is just something I have to do. I have to meet this person. I felt compelled. And I went and cycled to the address he gave me. I didn't know much about what this address would be. Um... And I arrived and realized it was a public swimming pool. And I thought, that is a strange place. And this is this guy, Max, has completed the uh, the don't offend course or whatever you might call it. It's the, um, the therapy. He's completed it. Uh, and that was an odd place, I thought, for me to meet him. But I, I went in. And at that point, you know, this is the first time I've ever met, uh, knowingly met, a, a, a pedophile. I was like, oh, you know, my heart was thumping in my mouth. Uh, I several times thought, you know what, I can't do this. I couldn't talk. My mouth was dry. And I went in and I'm queuing up in this swimming pool place, just thinking about the absurdity of this situation. Just like, how, what have I, what am I doing here? I don't even know, what am I? I don't even know why I, what I'm doing. Got in a queue and I'm looking around and just thinking like, there's a, there's a known pedophile just in this swimming place with all these families. You know, it's, something's odd here. And Eventually, I got in and I'm, I'm messaging him through some sort of secure uh, messaging app called Threema that he got me to download. And he was there, sort of a chubby guy with a baseball cap. Um, he's wearing like Speedos. It's it's almost like a stereotype, you know, of what you... The T-shirts over the Speedos, you just see these sort of podgy legs sticking out. And he was there babysitting three little girls, 11 years old. So... That was like a point where I thought, "Oh my God, this is I'm in too deep here. This is not this is not right." And I was just saying to him, "So who are these who are these girls then?" And he's saying, "Oh, it's okay. Like the 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 mother knows that knows about my condition, um, and she doesn't mind it." And I just thought, "Oh my God, this is too much. This is weird." And I had to leave. I I became quite emotional, which I'd never done. Uh, I I don't get that way. It's not it's not me. Uh, and I, I, it just took hold quite suddenly. So I said, look, Max, I'll, I'll speak to you another time, okay? Thanks for... I was being polite as well because I just don't know what to do at this point. I walked across to this park and I just sat on this rock for a while and this, like, visceral reaction took hold of me. Like, body was shaking. Uh, I felt very emotional. And it wasn't like I was... There was nothing from my past that had anything to do with this kind of thing. So it wasn't like for that. It was just, what am I doing? What is happening there? Uh, am I, you know, facilitating? Am I enabling? Am I? What can I do? Should I call the police? All these things going through my mind. Um, I ended up meeting the mother. Uh, I insisted to Max time after time. It took months and months uh, until he let me meet her, and she was just this ultra left wing woman, like ultra left, uh, who believed that minor attracted persons were 
some sort of you know minority who were being treated badly and she wanted to help and i was like but this is not the i i do get it i get what you're saying providing they're not offenders i get that they're human beings and they have a condition but you don't use your kids in an experiment like that so in all this time i was you know trying to meet max more and find out what was really going on i do believe him that he's not doing that he's not touching the kids you know but at the same time what he's doing is so inappropriate he's taking them presumably through the changing rooms he's presumably getting some sexual gratification from that and in my mind that's not okay so the books you know we need to talk about max and it's i go every sort of couple of chapters i return to max and let's see what you know a journalistic kind of thing and try to find out more um and I haven't gotten to the sort of that conclusion at the end where I really confront him and really, you know, I did go to the back to the doctors and I told them what's going on. And they were like, well, this, yeah, we wouldn't recommend he he does that. That's not right. But we, we're sort of powerless to stop him. And then in the, in the intervening chapters, I've met many of the other patients who, you know, very totally, you know, some of them uh, think that it's OK to you know be involved with children that is very rare that's rare most of them know they shouldn't and some of them say look i've got this condition i would never ever act on it i met a 25 year old woman um a few months back or maybe it was six months ago um who has an attraction to to babies i mean that this, this is the point where i think this is it's like for listeners that's hard to listen to um and i understand that it's just been a mad mad time and so, yeah, I've written this book. I've written it all together. And for now, it's like my literary agent said that the responses are just people are just a bit scared. And they'd rather that I wrote. I haven't written a book before. They would rather I write one or two other books first before trying that one because it's too much of a risk for the first one. But that's the crux of uh, my investigations. So much to unpack here. I want to get one thing out of the way quickly. The difference between a pedophile and someone who is minor attracted is the minor attracted hasn't acted on the feelings yet? So a minor attracted person is just sort of a nice way for them to say the word pedophile. Okay. Um, Not to but- interrupt you. So so I get it. I, I mean, I, I understand like we have to start re uh, considering things and, and sort of coming out of a bit of the dark ages, but... I'm having a real problem niceifying someone who wants to have a sexual relationship with a child by by mm. by softening that that concept and calling it minor yeah. attracted. I, yeah. I maybe I'll come around soon, but I, I mean, what are you gonna are you gonna call a serial killer someone who is homicidally defective? I mean, you know, like what? When are you gonna stop? What if it was a serial killer who never acted on their urges to kill? You call him Cannibal Cop. <laughs> oh, exactly. Yeah, you got the yeah. case of the Cannibal Cop. Yeah. Right. Who's that? Pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> it, yeah, it was a cop who had uh, thoughts um, about uh, eating people and went as far as to like Google them and stuff. Uh, and I believe there was some legal um, situation, but it's it's sort of filed under thought crime, you know, where there's no actual crime that was committed. But either way, that person shouldn't be a police officer. Well, Army Hammer's playing him in the movie. <laughs> wow. I'm kidding. I'm, I'm, to- I'm kidding. Oh, sorry. I thought, sorry, I'm quite a gullible guy. I shouldn't be for a journalist, but I am. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors, and now we're back to the program. The other reason my no attracted person is because pedophile is is a word that's that's very subjective and vague because it covers different things and it's unclear if it means somebody who's actually engaged in in uh, offending and i would include of course and anyone would include offending to be watching child pornography which which is not a term we use either uh we would say child sexual abuse material because pornography implies the children are you know uh consenting yes that makes sense in my head yeah that's a good one for sure Exactly. So it's all it's all just sciencing it up. The they call it an MAP. That's how a doctor would would often speak about them. The other really interesting thing I found when talking to them, um, and, and by the way, I, I should say, you know, I, I absolutely agree with your skepticism about about a lot of these people, and a lot of them are very dangerous. And uh, you know, I'm on I'm on your side with that. One time, I I, so I got into their 
community message board and it's a message board for a non-offending society so you know obviously any child abuse material would be immediately banned uh, and that kind of thing and they sort of these are people who are mostly lonely men and some women who try to help each other to deal with their urges and being alone because they can't form attractions and bonds to adults but at one point i got in touch because there was a there was a girl who got abducted in the uk about 20 years ago, 15 years ago, called Madeleine McCann. And it made like headlines around the world and nobody knew what had happened. And it came out about a year ago that uh, it, it was it's now believed that it was a German guy who was in a German prison who had been offending not just children, but had been raping women, uh, all sorts of sexual offences, you know, really nasty. And so I, because I had these contacts, I thought as a journalist, you know, I'm going to get the scoop on this. I'm going to, I know these contacts. So I got in the message board and I uh, started, I just wrote like, hey guys, you know, does anybody know this guy? Can you tell me anything about him? Because I knew that if I got anything about that, that could be a huge story in an English newspaper. Um, And when I said that, I said, does anybody know the pedophile called this? Now, I left it a couple of days because I was doing other projects as well. And I just, you know, and I came back a couple of days later to this forum. There were dozens or hundreds of messages, replies to me. They were livid. They were seething that I, and I thought it was because I had suggested they might know him. And I thought, okay, because he's a horrible guy. What it was, was that I had used the word pedophile to describe this guy because they would call him a pedo criminal. And they make a huge, uh, you know, delineation between the two. And they... They say that they hate those people because those people give them a bad name. So it's like what they said. It's like the difference between a religious person and a religious extremist who does something. And then when that happens, it makes them all look bad. Of course, it's much murkier than that because of the subject we're dealing with. But so that's the thing. So the people I've dealt with mostly are devout non-offenders. And that's why they call themselves minor attracted persons. But I totally understand why that we don't have to niceify it. I, I agree with you. So those are folks who cannot help themselves. They know it's wrong. They don't uh, abuse anybody, and they and and they leave it there. And they try to deal with their problems. Yeah, and they don't watch child sexual abuse material. That's what they tell me. You know, I'm not going to sit here and go, "Oh yeah, they were wonderful people." Then, and that's what's important about the book as well. I would never want the book to look like, "Oh, here I am going into these group of people and saying, oh, no, most of them are wonderful.'" Like. You know, I, I believe them just as much as you would believe them, which is, I have no idea. Some of them, probably not. Some of them probably do. The point is, 1% of the male population is thought to be exclusively uh, pedophile, right? Which means they cannot form any kind of physical attraction to adults. They have, they can't. So whether they say to themselves, don't, okay, I'm not going to get into these urges. I'm not going to think about it. They still can't, they can't be attracted to adults. They can't ever have relationships and they are destined to have a life alone. Um, And that's, again, I I need to keep making clear, like I'm not saying that let's feel sorry for these people at all. I'm just saying that those are the facts. And then there are also some pedophiles who uh, are not exclusive. So they have attraction to children uh, but they can also be attracted to to adults. And those people generally, from what the doctors have told me, you don't have to worry about them. They deal with their thoughts. They go, okay, I wish I didn't feel that way, but it's okay, I can marry an adult and be happy. It's the 1% of exclusives that we need to start to address and start to get on top of because it's all well and good us going, God, these these are thoughts and opinions that are hurting me to hear but that could be any of our children. So we need to, it's, I think it's very important for us to start to understand the mind of these people. In understanding the mind of the people, did you come across any evidence that some of these people or the majority of these people might have been abused sexually as children? Or is it a handful of those who, who were abused and those who might have been influenced by uh, pornography, um, not just, not just um, involving children, but I mean, the the pornography industry targets or well, how to say this young women, like, you know, that's one of the draws of pornography is that, you know, there's, there's the young factor to it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, we don't know if that's causal or the other way around, you know, does the porn make people uh, start to be attracted to younger girls uh, or or does the fact that a fact we don't want to address that a lot of men are attracted to those kind of girls as, as we saw historically um, 
And again, whenever people start to talk about history, it's often from a point of view of defending that view. And so we're not doing that at all. But it is true that historically, Japan with the, the samurai and... Um, um, is that what it's called, the samurai? I think when they, they would train a child like that. Uh, the, the Greeks did that. The Romans did that. Um, and these are things that we know are wrong in our society. But, we, you know, it's so hard to get to the bottom of what, uh, how our minds work. We don't know why some people are gay and some people are straight. We don't know why some people like brunettes and some people like... We have theories about why we all like different things. And just, you know, the, even the leading clinicians are not... Uh, they don't have an exact consensus about why, what makes someone a paedophile. I would say anecdotally from my part, having met these people, the vast majority of them did seem to have either have been sexually or at least mentally abused uh, in their childhoods. One therapist in particular said to me he has this theory that um, basically when you're nine years old, you start to like maybe nine-year-old girls, and when you're 10, you like 10-year-old girls, and that is supposed to grow as you grow. And it even happens, uh, I'm sure you've noticed as well, as you get older into your 30s or 40s, you know, uh, when I was 22, I would look at a 35-year-old woman as like, oh, God, it's like, a, I mean, some people like that, of course, as well. But I feel like, oh, it's like a mum or something. And now I'm at that age, it doesn't feel like that at all. And it's funny to see how that grows with time. And this therapist I spoke to, his point was that what happens is that somebody gets stuck in a moment, whether they're 9, 10, 11, they get stuck. And there seems to be some aspect of their personality, it's not just the sexuality, that gets stuck in that point. It is people who didn't really have a proper childhood, something horrific happened in their childhood. Um, and I mean, it makes me think straight away of Michael Jackson, right, who just didn't have a childhood, and he seemed to get stuck at that point. Um, and I should always remind people I'm a journalist, not a scientist, but I'm just basing this fairly anecdotally, but also on talks I've had with doctors and things. That that seems to be one of the leading theories about, about what makes someone a pedophile. Okay, Joe Rogan. I could be wrong, <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah, it's one of the theories. Oh, God. Well, th it's funny. Uh, yeah, Michael Jackson's a great example of that. And I was thinking about the um, lead character from uh, Lolita, he was attracted to Lolita because I think he had a girlfriend when he was like 12 and she ended up dying. So he got stunted like that. And I remember reading that and just thinking like that, that happens. Like that's, it feels too easy. You know, it feels too convenient as a plot point to say this is why. But I guess, you know, the example of Michael Jackson's great. You know what happened to him and you saw it and it played out on TV and in real time. Yeah. Time and time after time, the people I spoke to, there, I mean, there was one really difficult. The the only person I spoke to during my whole uh, research, who who was sort of pro adult child relationships. Now these are pretty much the most controversial people you can even think about, and I won't say his name because I know he likes the uh, he likes the attention. So, but he was a former policeman in Germany who's who's got some renown for this, um, and. It was that was difficult meeting this guy, but I took along this therapist who has this theory about how people get stuck. And this therapist, he was abused as a child, and so we went and met, and we're having this discussion in German, the three of us. And this pedophile is saying, uh, "Oh, it's fine. Like people touched me when I was a kid, and I turned out fine, and they're often okay, and it's all exaggerated. And the problem is, you keep telling them that they should be victims, and they feel like, and all this stuff." And it was so difficult to sit there with this therapist who had been abused, who was saying to him very clearly, no, this this basically kills children. Any kind of touching, they will never forget that. This is the most horrific thing you can do. And the guy just wasn't accepting it because, you know, his cognitive biases and maybe he's a bit psychopathic. But that was a really difficult exchange. Wow. Well, uh, you really dive deep into these subjects, Andrew. Um, it's mm. uh, it's it's pretty impressive. And uh, me and Lance were texting when we were gonna have you on the show, and I think I called you like the Indiana Jones of the um, journalism world because of how <laughs> sort of like deep and uh, almost like obsessed you get. And then I think Lance said, yeah, kind of like a Werner Herzog. And then I said, you more like a John Ronson. So we were kind of oh, going yeah. back and forth a little bit. Bottom line is we talk about you all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost surprised that this, <laughs> that this book isn't a documentary um, because you have another documentary coming out. We watched the trailer and there are a lot of the same moments um, seemingly in that documentary as your exorcism documentary where, you know, you kind of have 
these moments of I don't want to say being like a smart ass, but like being <laughs> like the audience, you know, you're like, what the fuck? Wh- what is going on right now? You have these moments and uh, it seems like with this story on um, pedophiles, you do as well. Um, and I just kind of want to like cut to you and see your face when you're doing these things, talking to these people and exploring this. Yeah, there were loads of times, um, and I think this happens to a lot of journalists who are doing these kinds of stories, where I th- where you do get that, I guess it's egotistical, but you are thinking like, I wish there were cameras on this now, because mm-hmm. nobody will believe it, and it's never going to be as strong in writing. The first thought was to make this as a, as a documentary, and I did tr- pitch it to a few different places, and some big production companies in the UK took it up as an idea. And it, that wasn't because it was too controversial. For some reason, as a, as a documentary, it's more palatable, um, the, the, the concept of paedophilia that's been done. There was uh, the paedophile next door was, was one uh, that one of them was Canadian. And there was a couple of British ones. Louis Theroux went into that terrain as well. Uh, what I was finding is, um, firstly, for British and American audiences, uh, it's better to have English subjects. And I was based in Germany. It's just It's just where I was and it's just where this is fascinating stuff was happening um and people just don't want to hear accents and foreign languages and stuff it's what made it so difficult to sell my exorcism film in the first place uh ha- having been in argentina the other thing is so i thought i've already got that to contend with and it's also that they're not going to show their faces uh that's one of the hardest parts so part of part of what i enjoyed so much about the research and i say enjoyed i use that term loosely because it was so scary at times but it was this uh access to people that nobody else had probably ever met. When I told one of the, the head doctor of this don't offend clinic, uh, he's a huge name in this field. When I told him about this 25 year old woman I met, he was flabbergasted and he was saying, please, can you introduce me to her? And I said, I would. And then I didn't because when I got home, I felt like, no, she's mine. Like I don't want to share <laughs> this journalistic <laughs> subject with, with somebody else because he'll show someone else. And before I know it, I'll see her on the BBC somewhere talking to someone and I think well what, hang on I discovered this that came from year after, after year of well two years I guess of of pushing and pushing and speaking to different people and eventually got that got me to a tiny village in the middle of nowhere in Germany where I'm meeting this woman um I really yeah I live for those moments I suppose as a journalist but also it would be impossible like the the trust you have to build with them for months would have been impossible to get them on, on a documentary. The more I started writing, though, I thought, you know what, I quite enjoy this. I can really go much deeper. I mean, if you think about how how complex this subject we're talking about is now, how do you convey that in a documentary? I mean, each interview you do in a documentary with, you know, a Louis Theroux or a Michael Moore documentary, you do, you know, let's say Michael Moore's interviewing someone in his hometown. He speaks to them for two hours and you get two minutes of that. You know, you get the sound bites. Are you a bad person? No. Yes, you are. Well, I guess I am. And that's it. So how can you possibly get to this thing of like, oh, paedophilia is bad and we should talk about it. But just because we talk about it, we're not saying it's good. It's still bad. But if we talk about it, it might help. That's too difficult. So I enjoyed writing, though. And the other thing is, as you get older, I think... um, it's not that I've become less egotistical because that's always there, right? And that's that you guys are podcasters. You must have a little bit of ego. I think we all no, do. No, not right? at all, actually. Nope. You're on an island there. Very, very humble. I, I have a lot of uh, self-effacing <laughs> qualities. <laughs> we are absolute narcissists. And, and so is everyone else, you know, and Instagram and all that. You know, we're all doing it. We're all up to it. Um, but yes, yeah, as, as you get older, I guess when you're younger, it's like, look at me. I'm on the TV talking to these people. And as you get a bit older, you're like, I don't need that anymore. I don't need to be the guy making the jokes in the TV. I'd quite like to write a book. And I, at first, I sort of told myself, oh, look, I'm becoming less egotistical. And then I thought about it and thought, <laughs> no, but seeing my name on a book, that's even more of an ego boost. So it's a new medium. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, a, and a, a more sort of esoteric one, a more <laughs> one that my teachers at school would have been proud of, that kind of thing, you know? And then you see your yeah. name on a podcast and you're like, I can't even, I don't even know where to go from here. <laughs> yeah, podcast doesn't have the no one cares. You, you, I tell people, they say, what do you do for a living? And I'm sort of ashamed to say I'm a podcaster. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, no, so not at well. all. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, if 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 I had a last name like Gold, I would have I would have really like worked that into the podcast title, like Gold Rush with Andrew Gold or Good as Good Gold. As gold. Good yeah. as Gold. Uh, yeah. O- always believe in your soul. Is that the song? Do you know that song? No, don't know that one. Gold, 
Always believe in your song. Da 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 da. I like it though. Da 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 invincible. Always believe. I'm going on mute. <laughs> <laughs> it must be a British song then. I thought that was American, but it must be a British song. Someone, someone listening will know. Well, tell us about you. You were talking about um, how you nurture these relationships and you work on these relationships with these people, and then you finally meet them, and that happened with this woman known as the crazy baby lady your new uh documentary that you uh have coming out is uh, my body their choice and it focuses on this woman take us into that a little bit yeah so i think it was a follow-up to the exorcist film which people could still find on youtube and and uh in the uk on bbc iplayer it's just there forever they just took all the rights didn't pay us properly but that's another that's something for another day but i yeah i'm always interested as you guys know in like these really edgy sort of characters and I, I was living in Argentina, you know, a couple of years ago when the whole um, vote on abortion was happening over there. And that wasn't necessarily a natural fit for me, abortion, because it's a very worthy and uh, quite uh, serious, of, of course, topic. Not that I can't do serious, but it didn't seem to have that edginess. And whenever I look for a story, whether it's on my podcast or, or documentaries, I try to get a mix of those two things. Like one, it has to be sort of deep and serious and important, uh, but two, it has to somehow be edgy and different and weird. And how do you do that with abortion? You know, without just, you're mostly going to abortion clinics and saying, should it be legal? And a lot of people are saying yes, and some people are saying no. It so happened that in Buenos Aires while I was there, there was this woman called the crazy baby lady, as you say, uh, Mariana Rodriguez Barela is her full name. And she is just this larger-than-life character. She's a pro-lifer, and she has uh, little plastic fetuses, and she goes to abortion clinics and screams at people who are trying to get abortions. And it's really quite horrible, actually. But uh, she's such a character that I was just drawn to her. And as I, as I am, whether it's the paedophile, whether it's the exorcist, just these people who are just so different from me and so on the fringes and so dark, and I, I love that. And again, it was a case of months and months of messaging her and trying to get into her good books. And I, I was even a little bit um, unfair because I told her that I was totally neutral. Uh, I'm a journalist and I'm totally neutral. And I, I suppose I used my inexperience and cognitive bias to convince myself I really was neutral. Like, hey, I'm a journalist and I'm neutral because I'm just going to listen to the facts. The the fact is that uh, I am I am pro-choice and always have been and... Um, you know, and I respect everybody who isn't, you know, 100%, but that doesn't change that I have a slant on it. And we embedded ourselves with her, uh, me and this was director Lucy de Cruz, who was living in Argentina with me, um, and followed the vote on abortion because it wasn't legal at the time. And she took us on the school run to pick up her kids and all of this stuff. And what was great about that, um, so we made this documentary and it's it's going to festivals now. Um, but what was great for me, it was a real learning curve in sort of dealing with people who have different views from myself because she's about as far on the spectrum from me as you can get because she's religious and I'm an atheist. She's, you know, yeah, anti-legal uh, abortion and that's not me. And she does some horrible things. But I got on with her really well and she was so nice to me and she she led us into her family she cooked us meals me and the director and the um, couple people who came to help out as well she was funny uh eccentric weird interesting so i came away really liking her i thought she could be you know my crazy aunt or my crazy grandma or my crazy sister um and we all have people like that in our lives and i started to think like she's not evil she just she lived a life that led her through different experiences to have a different view. The thing, the thing was, the, the thing I should say that we had an argument at the end because of my line of questioning, and she won't speak to me now. She hates me. Uh, she says I betrayed her and all this stuff. So we don't have a friendship anymore. But while I was with her, I yeah, I really thought like she's a good person, or she tries to be a good person by her set of morals. Um. <sighs> And I think I think there is there is a bit of a tendency in journalism to lean towards activism, and I was doing that at the time. I pushed too much on my side, and I regret that a little bit looking back because it was a couple of years ago now. But uh, yeah, I do think we need to sort of see people more as humans. I, I also found with her that I don't believe her when she says she's worried about a day old 
a bunch of cells, you know, literally the day after conception. I found I don't believe her. Uh, you know, she says it's about religion, God and stuff like that. I think what's really happening, uh, I read a lot about our threat receptors and a lot of people who hold racist views, for example, have got uh, a very high level of threat alert in their minds. And scientists are able to isolate that and sort of turn it off. And they found that people who were concerned about immigration and things like that, when that was turned off, they were much more accepting and welcoming. So what we're really dealing with when we find people who have views that we find abhorrent and unsavory are people who are scared. And I think if we look at them that way, it might help us to bridge the gap and talk people round. Like, that sounds a bit patronizing, I suppose, but I don't think she's worried about God and a one-day-old fetus. I think she's worried about a loss of her way of life, which was traditional uh, conservative Catholicism in Argentina, and a rise of young progressives who are different from her. And both sets of people have as much right as the other to exist and to coincide. But one will always, history tells us, maybe have more power than the other. Uh, both sides can be elite in different ways. So that's the fear of her being taken from the top of the table, perhaps. So, yeah, that taught me a lot. I, I found that really interesting. And I try to approach all my guests now, even if they have really you know, unsavory views. I try and get to the, you know, rather than you're a bad person, I'm going to moralize you because I'm better than you. I want to get to like, why do you think differently? And how can we both get closer together? So that was a good experience for me. Yeah, it sounds like you learned a lot coming out of that. And it just goes back to that age old uh, method of getting people to do the things that you want them to do by using fear. And the, the threat receptor that you're talking about is such an easy cord to, to pluck. You know, you, you know what makes people, you know what motivates people to do what you want them to do. And I don't mean you personally, I mean just you in general, like society. If, if, if you want people to be afraid, the immigration is a, is a great example. If you want people to be afraid of immigration, you use fear and you come up with these statistics about what, uh, minorities and immigrants have have done, and that means they're going to do on a larger scale. I mean, it's it's absolutely absurd, but you've struck that that uh, that that threat receptor, which is amazing. And she's doing the same thing. And you mentioned that you felt a little bit. I don't know if you use the word ashamed, but you said that you might have pushed a little too hard. What what why? I guess journalistically, is that a bad thing if the person you're covering is pushing even harder on on their side for something that's s sort of disingenuous? When you said like you don't really believe that she cares about a collection of cells at one day in ex you know one day in existence. Hmm. I I think you're right, and I can give some pushback. Uh... <sighs> providing i guess you're supposed to look at both sides and it's so so hard isn't it because i go into that as somebody who is pro-choice just because i i don't have any religious views and i just think okay well if it's been a few days obviously things get more complicated the more days into a pregnancy we are with someone is and i'm certainly not the person you know we're not women so so i'm not gonna i'm not a scientist but you know let me tell you no um so I can push back. What it was was when I, I watched it back very recently because it's going to this festival um, in a few weeks and there's a particular bit when we're having our argument at the end. The reason we argued, part of the reason we argued was, was because I brought up that her father had been a part of the dictatorship in Argentina in the 1980s. There was a dictatorship there that basically um, disappeared. That's the verb they use. They disappeared tens of thousands of people in Argentina at the time who were like enemies of the government what they were doing is like dropping them out of helicopters into the sea just getting people uh sometimes drugging them sometimes not and just throwing them into the sea from helicopters letting them you know it was horrific and her father was a, a part of that he was a, a high up lawyer who was part of that dictatorship that was disappearing people and then selling their children to friends of the regime uh wealthy families who wanted children so I did say to her something I'd held back for weeks until our final talk, like, how can you be the face of pro-life when your father, your family is known for this? 
And she, you know, quite rightly responded, well, listen, we're not all responsible for our families. And then I said, yes, but you're still very close with your father and clearly uh, support his actions. And that made things very difficult. But what it was, was there was a bit where I then turned to her and said, look, I think it's... I said something along the lines, I might be exaggerating it now because it it did make me shudder when I looked back, but I said something like, Argentina's been left behind the rest of the world and it needs to catch up. Uh, and I think having seen all the activism here from the younger people, I think it's going to get there. I said something like that and I thought that was too much of a personal opinion. Um, and they, the other side has a right to an opinion as well. And I, I have to always keep that in mind. I think that's I think that's what it was. It's incredible. It's incredible. I, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm never sharing my notes from this interview with any... Actually, I'm going to burn these because I have too many words on here that could get me in trouble that I would have to explain away. <laughs> oh, welcome to my world the last two years, honestly. It's scary. It is scary. But then, it's you know, I just... I, I get quite stubborn in those moments, you know, because I got friends of mine say to me, like, but aren't you worried you've been in this, like, community? I've been on their message board, for example. And, and I should add that never at any point have I even accidentally stumbled across something that would be, like, that you're not supposed to look at. So one friend even said you should you should get in touch with the police and tell them so they know you're looking at this. And I just thought, like, I guess it's that stubborn journalistic feeling of, like, I'm not doing anything wrong. I don't care. And what do you mean? We, I guess I, I don't like being told we can't talk about something, whether it is eugenics, whether it is paedophilia, whatever taboo subject. that That's annoyed me since I was a child. I've, and that might be why I wanted to become a journalist. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of journalists and podcasters, we all feel that way. You know, that's our jobs. Don't tell us we can't talk about something. And it is a bit stubborn. Yeah, I'm, screw them. I'm, I'm talking about it. <laughs> I also think that if you uh, called the police or emailed them and said, hey, I just want to let you know I'm not looking at uh, child uh, sexual assault images, they would definitely assume you were. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you can't win. I think, I think you know, you've just got to be confident. In, we don't live in a world where you get arrested for crimes you don't commit. Uh, and and even sometimes again, you must have interviewed some people who who you think oh by association, I could be linked to them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think how else are we going to learn about this? And I think there are a lot of topics similar that you know, someone needs to dive into. No, you know, it's not for everybody to to do it personally or to necessarily consume it, um, but someone needs to for the research for the greater good of learning. I think so. So well done, Andrew. And uh, what film festival is your documentary uh, appearing in? So that's going to something called the Terra di Tutti Festival in uh, Italy, in Bologna. And wow, it's, geez, uh, pardon us. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's like some sort of human rights festival. Um, we sent it out to a few, you know, and we were just, we didn't expect to hear back from anyone because it's just these things are so competitive. So we were really excited about that. I can't go, which is really frustrating, but it, my director, Lucy, might be able to go and do a Q&A or something, and then maybe there'll be people buying it um, or something like that, we hope. Uh, if not, if someone's listening who wants to buy a documentary about abortion or a book about paedophilia, then uh, get in touch. 